Well, good day, everyone. It is good to be together, though separated in space, together to worship our Heavenly Father. This church, God's people, gather to honor Him, to bring Him praise and glory and worship. Um, people have gathered here at the building. People are gathering in people's homes uh, to, to worship together. And we really want to continue to encourage you to do that. Now, if you're new to these recordings, we trust that wherever you are, that you will thoroughly enjoy this time that you're spending with Almighty God. Uh, may it be an encouragement of challenge. And in it all, may our God be worshipped, right? That is what we have gathered to do, to bring honor and glory to Him who is worthy of our praise. We're going to start today with Larry reading to us from Psalm 95, and it gives us uh, some insight in, into what we're doing here. It talks about why we worship, and even gives us some ideas how we may worship. So Larry, would you read? This morning's reading is taken from Psalm 95, verses 6 and 7. It's taken from the NIV. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. Let's sing together those verses. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, and the sheep of His Pardon for sin and a peace 
church family. Lord, we've seen people grow in faith. We see how you haven't given up on us. Great is your faithfulness. And so today, Lord, we, we just lift our hands in prayer. We bow down. We kneel before you, God, our maker. And we bring you praise. For you are good and your love endures forever. Accept our praise today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Indeed, it has been a difficult year, and, and I, I love that about this next song we'll be singing, Blessed Be Your Name. It, these verses, uh, well, they take turns. The first verse is about blessing God's name, worshiping Him in good times, and then the next verse will be about worshiping God in more difficult times. And I hope you pick up on those words and, and, and come to a place where indeed all of us will be able to do that, to worship Him in good times and in bad. Blessed be your name. And the Lord is taken away. In the name of the Lord we pray. Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name on a road parked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, say the light will say, Blessed be the name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back 
to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Now, as we continue to worship apart, of course, the giving, the generosity is lived out in slightly different ways. Uh, many of you have been extremely uh, faithful in giving and, and switched over to more electronic ways of giving. And yeah, it's, it's actually simplified a lot of things. Others, of course, continue to drop off their, um, their donations, their gifts here at the church during the week or on Sunday morning. And yeah, we encourage you to do that. Any questions about it, give us a call or log on to it special page on our website about all the different options for you to give to the ministry of Emmanuel Church. Yeah, and again, see it as an act of worship, not just as merely paying the bills. Uh, as giving from our resources is worship. May he be praised. Now, just a couple of words about something we began to talk about last week, and that was the what I consider to be the broken nature of the outward movement of the church, uh, the inability to effectively reach our communities for Christ. Um, yeah, so how do we go about that? We'll be unpacking that a little bit during the messages, but there are some simple ways that I would encourage you to consider. Uh, these videos you're watching, if you're watching from home, uh, you can share those videos. You can share it on your social media feeds. You can... Uh, Copy the link right from YouTube and put it in, in a personalized email to someone. You say, hey, this may be of encouragement to you. Yeah, we just really encourage you to consider doing that, to just share the videos that we are producing as a church with those who might benefit from that. Uh, better yet, possibly, is for you to invite somebody to watch these videos with, to worship together with. Um, yeah, I think we're at a time where we, we, we have learned how to be a bubble in a safe way. We, we have learned how to, how to keep distance. Um, yeah, I think we, we, have, we have done a lot of learning about how to do these things, gathering in, in safer ways over this past year. And so who, who might you want to invite in on your bubble to worship with? I know this may mean that you uh, actually have to get dressed on a Sunday morning before you watch or whenever you watch this. And... Yeah, it's, it's pretty more convenient to just do it by yourself. But, but who, who may need your um, companionship to watch this with? Who, who, who may be benefiting from you watching with them? And so, yeah, I'm going to encourage you to, to give that some thought as well. And it goes for living room church, if you will, for watching these worship services. But for our small groups, too, who, who might benefit from being part of the group that you're involved with? Who could you invite in on that? Now, be sure to talk to your small group leader about this as well. And say, how can, we, how can we do this? So, yeah, just some thoughts for you to consider. Now, when it comes to Living Room Church, we're going to have just a short interview or a bit of testimony from a few people who have been doing this for almost a year now, and they have absolutely loved it. And, so, yeah, uh, have a listen to this. What we do with our group is that one week it'll be at our house, another week it'll be at Bill and Margaret's, another week it'll be at Cam and Cheryl's. So we alternated around and we found that really, really good. And the other thing that we're doing with our uh, group is that we also have a potluck, so we eat too. So it's, uh, we watch the service and naturally we watch both services. We uh, found the family service really, really interesting. We really enjoy that. So we do both services, and then afterwards we have a meal together, and it's been really, really good. So I guess because of the pandemic and not being able to get around and be with other people, this really works for us. It, uh, you don't feel as far away from the church and everything with having everybody getting together like that. So like Cameron said, we've been doing this ever since the pandemic started, and you started doing the videos, we've been doing it. So uh, we really do enjoy it. And you're kind of in your own time, you're not on a, on a timetable, so you can 
go up and grab a coffee if you want, and then come back and stop, stop the video. <laughs> so, yeah, I, uh, we've been doing it now for about a year. It is absolutely phenomenal. It's been really, really a blessing to everybody. Everybody's opened up. Bill and Margaret and Cam and Cheryl, we, we know everything there is to know about each other. Um, we're learning and growing and making mistakes. But it's, it's our family. We really love each other. So I just praise the Lord for that. And we'll just carry on doing it. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> Good morning, church. It's time for our congregational prayer. And this morning, when I lead you in prayer, we're just going to take a little bit of time and um, have a time of meditation with some quiet music playing in the background. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come together as a church family today, we praise you for being our rock and source of strength during these very difficult times. We thank you for spring and the hope this season of change and growth brings. We thank you that even though our world as we know it seems to be falling apart, we live in this turmoil with the assurance of your love and protection. We thank you for all the hardworking and courageous frontline workers, medical, teachers, service industry, truck drivers, and other support workers. Please continue to protect them and their families. Give them rest and peace. We thank you for the COVID vaccines and ask that you stir the hearts of each person to do their part in receiving the vaccine and living a responsible lifestyle. Lord, we pray for our church family. We think of those who are experiencing health issues, Alice, Gary and Jane, Kim, Clarissa, and for our seniors in long-term care, Ken, Mildred, Shirley, and Marge. We also pray for those who are confused, afraid, grieving, lonely, depressed, and struggling with life. Please surround each person with a protective hedge of angels and give them peace. As we continue to examine the rebuilding of the walls around Jerusalem, help us to rebuild our walls, which are broken and so much in need of restoration. Lord, your desire for us is to pick up our broken pieces, clean them off, and put them back in place. As we pause for a time of silent prayer, help us to confess with humility and honesty those pieces holding us back. We ask you, dear Lord, to hear our prayers from deep in our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for hearing the prayers from our hearts. We praise you for the hope and restoration that comes only from you. We have laid our prayers at the foot of your cross and ask that you receive them and that each of us will step forward having been forgiven and walking in obedience with you. As the psalmist says, I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing of the Lord's praise as he has been good to me. We pray this all in your precious name. Amen. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the jewels, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? 
Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they are building? If even a fox climbed up on it, he would break down their wall of stone. Hear us, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height for the people who worked with all their heart. But when Sambalat, Tobia, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the men of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the labors is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, Wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot, and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officials posted themselves behind all the people of Judah, who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked, but the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, The work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. So we continued the work, with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time I also said to the people, Have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night, so they can serve us as guards by night and work by day. Neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon, even when he went for water. One of the things that my parents used to love to do was to people watch. They would go to the city and doing all their errands and the shopping, but then they would take some time and find a patio and order themselves a cup of coffee, and then they would just sit there and watch all the people walk by. They loved the diversity of the people they saw. I mean, a very multicultural society there too, right? All the different colors, the different cultures, the different personalities, the way people dressed, the way people carried themselves. They loved it, and it was kind of fun for them to just see that diversity of people walking by and trying to imagine what made all these people tick, what made them get up in the morning, what motivated these people to, you know, to be about their day and to do the things they were doing. Anyway, people watching. As a pastor, I get to do a lot of 
people watching. Just by default, it just happens all the time. And it's a beautiful thing because I get to see this incredible diversity of people, the diversity of which the church is made up out of, the diversity of different gifts, different passions, different personalities, different backgrounds. It's an absolute wonderful thing to behold. But today I want to dig a little deeper and and talk about the diversity in, in in a smaller way, if you will, a very defined way. And that's the diversity in how people respond to problems, how people respond to difficulties, opposition. For there's huge diversity in that. I mean, some people, you know this, some people just they just don't want it. They don't want the difficulty. So they put their head in the sand, if you will, and they just ignore the whole thing. They they just go by the motto of ignore it and it will go away. Other people, well, they just give up. They run at the first sign of trouble. They just throw up the hands in the air, said, No, I'm not gonna do this. Still others become despondent, even depressed, and they just can't carry on because there are these problems. Still others play the blame game. They point the finger to some outward source usually and say, well, it's because of them that this is happening. But of course, that doesn't fix the issue either. And then there is those people, and you probably know some, they, they seem to come alive when they're faced with problems. It seems like they thrive when the wheels come off. They just see it as a personal challenge or something. And they just, when when they're faced with problems, they just come alive and they dig in. Anyway, not long after Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem to rebuild those walls that had been broken down, well, he was facing some serious problems. He was facing some serious opposition. Remember, Nehemiah had returned. He had surveyed the damage. We talked about that last week. He had seen how incredibly broken these walls were. But then he had gone to the people and he had had made them aware of this brokenness, that brokenness that they had become blind to, that they had just learned to put up with. He he made it very clear that these things had been, been broken and were broken and needed to be fixed. And he somehow motivated the people to get involved, to roll up their sleeves, and to rebuild these walls. I mean, he did such a good job at that motivating that we read in chapter 2, verse 18, let us start rebuilding. So he began this good work. I mean, he just set out to motivate them. He managed to do it, and the people rolled up their sleeves and began the rebuilding process. But that's where the trouble began as well. Verse 19, but when Sembalat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I mean, there are the first signs of serious opposition. Well, what we now want to look at then is how Nehemiah responded to that opposition. I'm telling you, his response, his example, exemplary, exemplary. And as we face our inevitable challenges in this life, including this whole rebuilding of this outward movement that I believe is broken that we talked about last week, we will do well to learn from Nehemiah's response to his problems. So let's have a look. Now, to set the stage a little bit more, I want to go back again to chapter 2, verse 16, just real briefly. Remember, the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Nehemiah had been abundantly clear in his own mind that it was going to be all hands on deck. Right? That the people as a whole would have to work together to accomplish this incredible task. And sure enough, he motivates them then, as we already talked about. And in chapter 3, we see them do this. 
Now, I trust you are reading this entire book, because we're not reading the whole book, that you're reading through these chapters and some different versions from time to time to just really help you understand the scene here. But chapter 3 is all about all these different people working at these different parts of the walls to repair the gates and the walls and all that. Beautiful picture, of course, of God's people working together. But just because they were working together, and just because progress was being made, does not mean there was no trouble. Because, oh boy, was there trouble. Pat has already read the story for us. I mean, you heard the story. You know the story. There was serious trouble that had to be faced. When Symbalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? And then Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, what they are building, even a fox climbing up on it would break down their walls of stones. Who was the opposition? Well, let's have a look at that. There was Sembalat, who was a Samaritan. Who were the Samaritans? Well, the Samaritans were, of course, a mixed group of people, if you will. They, the northern ten tribes of Israel, referred to as Israel, had been scattered by the Assyrians a long time before this. But they hadn't taken everyone away. They had left some behind. Some of the Jewish people had been left behind in that region. And, and, and then as the Assyrians conquered other nations, they would take some of their people and bring them down to this land vacated by the, all the Israelites that had left. And so these different tribes, these different people groups began to mix over time. And, and, and what, what became of that is now referred to as the Samaritans. And they would have had some Jewish element to them. Even the religion would have been somewhat Jewish, but they were no longer considered the people of God. All right? So they were the Samaritans, and they were in opposition to the true Jews coming back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city of God. Okay, so they were in opposition. Then, as we already read, there was Tobiah. And Tobiah was an Ammonite. Now, the Ammonites had been enemies of Israel for forever, seemingly. And they lived to the northeast of the Dead Sea. And then there was Geshem, who was an Arab. They lived to the southeast. And then there was Ashdod, that was originally, of course, a Philistine city towards the west. But now the whole region was referred to as Ashdod. And so the whole point of all this, who is the, the opposition, who is causing all these problems, was everyone. All the people surrounding them were causing problems. They were all having issues with them rebuilding this city. Easily an overwhelming prospect. And their strategy, as we already saw, as I read a couple of those verses, is that they, they would mock the people, they would demoralize, they would intimidate, they would threaten them. Nehemiah himself said in verse 8, they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. And again in verse 11, also our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to their work. Just imagine that for a moment. So you're, you're from one of the villages out in the hillside there, and, and, and you're now in the city helping restore these walls, but your family's still back home. And, and this is dangerous. It's not for you, it's for your family. It, this is hard work. It's exhausting and potentially could cost you your life. And I can well imagine that a person would say, you know what, this was all a great idea to rebuild these walls. But this is getting a bit too much. I'm out. I, I can well imagine people would say, you know what, I quit. In my people watching, I see people do this all the time. Not everyone but at all kinds of people 
who give up. It's not like they, they, they don't think that the project is worth it or that restoration needs to be sought out or, or whatever the issue might be, whatever the problem is related to that it isn't worth fixing, it's that they can't do it. It's too costly. It's too difficult. I'm out. I quit. Not so with Nehemiah, though. His response, like I said, exemplary. And so we're looking to him to, to, to give us this great example then, similar to what he had done when he first heard about the crumbling walls of Jerusalem, of Jerusalem laying in shambles. Uh, remember what he did in chapter 1? He prayed, right? He prayed. He does the same thing now. And the prayer he prays, well, it's not quite the same kind of prayer that you and I uh, might well what you might call a New Testament prayer where we pray for our enemies, right? This is like a, a true Old Testament prayer. Here, here you go, verse 4. Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Oh, <laughs> he's praying, God, have your way with these people. They, they have opposed your work. Anyway, though we may not want to pray a prayer exactly like that today, we're more into the New Testament, a time of grace, right? We we're praying for enemies. Nehemiah had it right in that he turned his eyes upward. He turned his eyes to God. He recognized he needed God's help. And so he doesn't quit, but instead prays. And so should we. What an example. Again, in verse 8, we read this verse already, but they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. Verse 9, but we prayed to our God. We prayed to our God. There is problem we don't quit, we pray. Uh, in my people watching, I see this too, regularly, often. I love it. I mean, yes, there are those who quit. There's always going to be people who run away. There's always people who want to ignore the issues. But there's always people in this church that say, you know, we need to pray. We're not going to quit without a fight. And we're going to turn our eyes upward. We're going to turn our eyes to heaven. We recognize we need God's help. Nothing will be accomplished unless we pray. These are the people who show up at prayer meetings. These are the people who continue to show up at Pray Nova Scotia prayer gatherings, where we gather with all these believers from around Nova Scotia to pray about this whole COVID pandemic thing. And these are the people who will say, we need to pray more. We need to pray more often. And they're right. We have to pray. We have to turn to God. Personally, this is not my default setting. That said, I'm growing in this area. I'm becoming more and more convinced that indeed Nehemiah had it right, that his example indeed is exemplary, that when we face serious problems, we don't quit but we turn to God in prayer. Now I want to read verse 9 again, because I didn't read the whole verse before. So here we go. But we prayed to our God and posted guards day and night to meet this threat. We prayed to our God and posted a guard. We prayed to God and we acted. You see that? Nehemiah didn't say, okay, we're having a problem. Let's have a prayer meeting. And then we'll just sit back and wait for God to fix this problem. No, not at all. He recognized that he had a role to play in all this. And so they prayed to God. They didn't quit. They prayed to God. And, and you might want to underline that little word if you're into underlying scripture. And we posted a guard. We acted. Boy, did he act. Yes, he posted a guard. 
he communicated clearly with his own people what had to be done. In the process, he ended up communicating with his enemies too, just by posting guards where he did, and, and they could see what was happening. And the, and the enemy, well, they, they came to understand that their plans to, to cause trouble had been thwarted. He posted the guards. He made sure that people had weapons at the ready, always ready to defend the city and the work. He had people stay in the city overnight so they could guard the city at night. They had an early warning system with a trumpet. I mean, read about it. The list goes on. Nehemiah didn't quit. He prayed and he acted. He rolled up his sleeves and so did the people. The people acted by adapting. Oh, what an example. And that way of responding to the problems laid the foundation for success. It led to the wall being rebuilt. You can read about that in chapter 6. Even though, well, when they completed the wall, the opposition still didn't end. Friends, in my people watching, I always see some people acting, willing to act, willing to roll up their sleeves. These are salt of the earth kind of people. These are the kind of people that will be the front and center to get involved. They're willing to lean into it. They're willing to, to, to dig in their heels. They're willing to work at great expense. They're willing to, to, with blood, sweat, and tears, to do what it needs to be done to fix what is broken. I suppose that is my natural inclination to just buckle down, to not give up. It's like, well, we're not going to go down without a fight. And so here I am, ready to fight, if you will. Oh. Church, Jesus in John chapter 16, verse 33, makes it very clear that in this world, we will have problems. And he said that to his own disciples. We will have trouble. Even as we go about doing God's work and God being almighty and all that, there still will be trouble. Even as we set out to fix that which we believe is broken, as in the outward movement of the church, as we set out to fix that, there will be trouble. There will be opposition. There will be discouragement. And the question for us to consider then is how will we respond? How will you respond when that happens, will you quit or will you keep going? Will you quit or will you act? What, which, which is it going to be? Will you throw up your hands and say, this is just too much. I didn't sign up for this. Or you say, no, we got to keep going. This, this thing that is broken needs to be fixed. Too much is at stake. I will keep going. And then if you decide to keep going, will you be a prayer or a doer? Will you be that person that says, you know, before we do anything else, we need to pray about this. We need to pray more because without prayer, nothing will ever get accomplished. Or are you going to be that person who's like myself, more naturally inclined to say, oh, we've got to roll up our sleeves and we've got to fix this thing. Will you be a prayer? Will you be a doer? Let's learn from Nehemiah's example, because truly it's exemplary. He did not quit. He turned his eye to heaven. He prayed. And he acted. Church, friends, let us not quit. Let us persevere in this journey by being a praying doer by being in prayer as we act. Let us be on our knees and on our feet, all the while being willing to adapt as Jesus leads us. Heavenly Father, we know you're right when Jesus, you said that there would be trouble. Time and again we face this, and we, we, 
We confess that sometimes it just seems so much easier to give up, to quit. Sometimes it's just so discouraging that we want to just walk away from it all. Forgive us for that. Help us, Lord, to be like Nehemiah, to not give up, but then to turn our eyes to you, almighty God. And to be willing, Lord, to roll up our sleeves and to be used by you. And to that end, Holy Spirit, fill us and help us to adapt to the circumstances. Help us, Lord, to be willing to change how we go about things that we might accomplish what you have in mind for your church. And Lord, as we consider this whole outward movement of the church that has been so ineffective for so long, Lord, continue to open our eyes to that. Lord, continue to, to show us what is really going on there. And Lord, maybe then not give up in the face of all those challenges, but Lord, help us then to turn to you continually to depend on your strength, but then the Lord at the same time to be willing to do what needs to be done, to be willing to do what we need to do, and to be willing to be flexible in how we're going to go about that. For God, this is too important to just let go. Holy Spirit, continue to bring this to mind. In our discussions with each other, Lord, lead those discussions that we might understand these things better and in the end then, Lord, that we may see that our movement restored and effective with many coming to a saving faith in you, Jesus. In that, may you be honored. Amen. Now, we sang this last song in the past, pre-pandemic, but it's been a while, so it may sound kind of new to you, but it just fits with this message of turning our eyes to God in prayer, rolling up our sleeves, doing our part in, in working on our problems. And we can do so with the confidence that in Christ, we are more than conquerors. When my hope and strength is gone, you're the one who calls me on. You are the are the fight that's in my soul. Oh, your resurrection power burns like fire in my heart. When waters rise, I lift my eyes up to the earth grow. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. I will sing it to the night. Christ is risen and on high. Greater is he living in me than in the world. No surrender, no retreat. We are free and we're redeemed. We will declare over the air, you are the hope. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You have overcome this world, this life. We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in the power in our face, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. Nothing is impossible, every chain is breakable with you. We are victorious. You are stronger than our hearts. You are greater than Are victorious. Sing it one more time. Nothing.
is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Every chain is breakable with you. We are victorious. You are stronger than our hearts. You are greater than the dark with you. We are victorious. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You have overcome this world, this life. We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in our name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our Conqueror. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You have overcome this world, this life. We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. Our Lord, our God, our conqueror. Yes, God, he is our conqueror. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask, or imagine according to his power that is at work within us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever amen your love shines through into my heart and you make me a part of who you are of who you are my